It's very interesting. Yeah. So what from Psalms in particular re resonates with you? Um, well, I'm a teacher at the moment and there's one about Jesus being like as a shepherd. Yes. And I see teaching almost like being a shepherd. And I think it might be John 10, 11 or something where it's like the good shepherd keeps his soul amongst the sheep or something like that. I try and be the best teacher of me. Can I tell you something about John 10, 11? Where, where Jesus referred to as a good shepherd. You see, the Greek word is a Greek word called kalos. Kalos means, its primary meaning, as you're a teacher, you will be well acquainted, its primary meaning is beautiful. Its tertiary meaning is good. Now, of more significance, in Mark 10, 17, where Jesus declines being called good and refers that to God alone, the Greek word there for good is agathe or agathos. So two Greek words for the word good. In John 10, 11, but in, jo in Mark 10, 17, the primary meaning of agathos is good. However, in John 10, 11, the English translators have translated as good shepherd. However, it should be translated as beautiful shepherd because that is the primary meaning of the word. You following me? So why that distinction then? Why the beautiful shepherd edition? Well, beautiful shepherd is not what they translate. You've read it as in John 10, 11 as good yeah, shepherd, good shepherd yeah. but that's a wrong translation. By, by grammatical configurement, they should have it as beautiful shepherd. And you can check that out on the Greek Strong's Accordance, which is the, the, the Bible in Greek, which gives you the definitive terms from the English into the Greek. Because you're aware the New Testament was written in Greek. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying to you basically, see, when you're saying about the good shepherd, First of all, he actually means that he's the beautiful shepherd. That's the better translation. But I'll take your um, analogy in terms of you being a school teacher and you're looking after your students and then a shepherd looking after his flock, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I do understand the analogy of that. But what I want you to singularly focus on, my friend, what's your name? Uh, my name's Mustafa. Delighted to meet yeah, you, Anthony. Right. West Ham supporter, yeah? <laughs> my friend, I mean, my friend's a good friend of mine. He's become Muslim. He's a West Ham supporter. He goes to a lot of the home games as well. He's, English. he's an English guy. So, um, just to reiterate the point, but what these are excellent parables and teachings you can decipher. However, what we want you to initiate and what we want you to grab is who is God and who is Jesus. Sorry. I gave you a reference in John 17, 3. Christ says the following, For this is eternal life, that they may know you as the only true God, and whom you have sent, the messenger Jesus Christ. Look at how it distinguishes between God as the only true God and he is a messenger, which is the message of Islam, that he was a messenger. Furthermore, if we look at the explicity of Christ's statements from his own mouth as to who he was, he makes reference to who he was in Mark 6, 4 and Matthew 21, 11. Jesus says, I am a prophet. He never says, I am God. Then as you're a school teacher, I can, we can speak very easily. Check this out. The term son of God versus the term God the Son. Observe the subtle distinction between the two. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm going to come to you. It's going to really, I mean, if you're a teacher, you can really delve into the text and think how on earth have Christians over 2,000 years misunderstood these basic concepts? So, Son of God, in, by definition, just means one who represents God. It's replete throughout the whole yeah. New Testament. Matthew 5 9, Best are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. John 10 33 and it's replete throughout however the term God the Son which was later understood for Christ as being the second person of the Holy Trinity that is never mentioned for him in the Bible this was a later addition to his name at the various councils in the fourth century for so four five hundred years later they made Jesus God the Son which was the second but the Son of God which is a title applicable for those who represent God it's ubiquitous meaning it's widespread so, having understood these terminologies, first of all, who was Christ? As I made mention, he is one who represents God. Yeah. As being a son of God in that particular sense, a representative of God. Yeah, it's interesting because I always wondered, you know, on the cross when he, he actually finally like doubts God's plan, like if he was God, he wouldn't be doubting God. Right, then, now let's get on further to this. You see, what it is, the common understanding amongst Christians was that he was, and notice my words carefully, he was a willing sacrificial lamb, happy and ready to die for the sins of mankind. But his every action in the run-up to his supposed crucifixion is showing us to the contrary. Like he's begging God in the Garden of Gethsemane in Hebrews 5, 7. 
oh God, take this burden of cup away from me. And it says in the same text, God hears, it says in the same text, God hears his supplication and listens to him. And then of more significance for you, because you cited Psalms earlier, Hebrews 5, 7 is cited in Psalm 116, where it says that God will protect his chosen one. So that crying out by Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in 5.7 is shown to us as the prophecy in Psalm 116, where God will save him. And that's not the only one. Psalm 91, verses 10 to 16, same thing. He cried and God saves him. God saves. You can watch the, listen to those verses. Today, when we go, you can watch what we have. Yeah, so it's Psalm 91. I can give you Psalm 91, Psalm 116. Psalm 33, Psalm 22, and I can go on relentlessly. All these are evidences that, that Christ was going to be protected by God when the people who tried to harm him would make that attempt to harm him. That's, that's the first point. And it's a paradoxical within the Bible that a, a crucified Messiah is referred to as a curse. And we know Christ wasn't a curse. So, and then your, your point about why should he be crying on the cross? Just imagine he was, this was the plan between God and Jesus right from the beginning that he would die for the sins of mankind and the very last thing he says is why have you forsaken me yeah. does that make any that sense at all that, yeah. and there's your answer your answer is in the Psalms God doesn't forsake him he has a close brush with death but he escapes now in the idioms of the Jews at the time if you have a close brush with death it's as if you've died yeah. so for example the analogy of the sacrifice of Abraham of his beloved son Isaac where we know that he has a, I mean, the, the, the attempt is made just for the sake of appeasing God to show how much Abraham loves God but what happens Isaac is saved from the crucifixion I mean from the attempt to kill him so the analogy of Christians often refer to is of the example that the analogy of Christ is like Abraham and Isaac where the father sacrifice where the father is about to sacrifice the son but what, we, what do we observe in the, in the case of Isaac, when the father's having some doubts, as the biblical narration tells us, the son says to him, hold firm, do what God demands. But there you have Christ in the New Testament, who's supposed to be analogous to Isaac, he's begging God, no, I don't want to go for all this. So what, we, what we're observing is that Islam, in the Quran, it says the following, and the Jews boasted, we kill Christ, the son of Mary, but neither did they crucify him, nor did they kill him. But so it was made to appear to them. But for a surety they killed him not. Nay, God raised and lifted him to himself. So Jesus was never going to be crucified by them. God was going to protect him on all occasions. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like, do Muslims believe in the three days later kind of thing or not? Um, in the three day resurrection? Yeah. This is just something concocted by the, uh, by the Christians in effect that he dies and is resurrected on, on, on the third day. And when they say, oh, this prophecy is from Luke chapter 24, verses 44 to 48, that he will die and be resurrected on the third day. But when you scour the Old Testament, there is no prophecy as such. You don't find it anywhere as such. So what we do, we also give the sign of Jonah. You know when Christ says to the Jews that my sign will be the sign of Jonah? Well, he was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. But was he alive or dead? I can't remember what happened with Jonah. Jonah, when the, when the fish ate him. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah? So the miracle that the Jews ask of Jesus is that if you're indeed now going to escape and Christ says, I won't give you any sign, but my sign to you will be the sign of Jonah. And that, what is he trying to say? That although an attempt will be made to harm me, I will escape. So just as the fish ate supposedly Jonah, Jonah didn't die in the belly of the whale. And oh, same, die, yes, and neither did Christ then. So he's giving that analogy to the Jews that I will be in the belly of the earth, but he will not die. Because we know when the, when the fish ate Jonah, he didn't die. He was alive in the belly of the well for three days, wasn't he? Yeah. So that's the analogy Christ is giving. My miracle to you will be, I will be in the heart of the earth, just as Jonah was in the belly of the well. So what we are observing is that there is tons of evidence there that Jesus wasn't crucified. Okay, tons and tons of evidence. What later happened is the biblical writers who were influenced by Paul considerably, who wanted to use this terminology in the book of Galatians, he says, I portray, look at this key word, 
I portray to you Christ crucified. Meaning he's going out of his way to show, listen, I'm trying to sh hammer it home to you that Christ was crucified. Because he wants to develop his own new theology on Jesus dying for the sins of mankind on the cross. So he's trying to push that forward. Whereas the first Christians, they didn't believe that. The early Christians, like the Colidicians and the Basilidians, they didn't believe he, he was crucified. And God, God saves him from crucifixion. Because then we, we wouldn't, God wouldn't allow his Messiah to be taken by his enemies. So in what sense was he saved, like almost to take his soul? Yeah, so God was taken up, uh, so Jesus was taken up uh, by, uh, by God. And then um, we believe, like Christians, that he will return at the end time. And he would establish peace and justice on the earth. And he will go against the anti-God system, which will be prevalent in the world. Are you following what I'm saying to you? Yeah, yeah. But that doesn't make him, people say, oh, well, look, he's going to return. Hence, he must be God. No, this is the plan of God to have him come at the final, come in the final days. And then he will um, return and establish and he will become as a Muslim. Because he, you know, like the way we pray five times a day, yeah. we bow and prostrate to God. Did you know in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalm, chapter 95, verse 6, it say it's the exact way the Muslims pray. Come, let us worship. Let us bow before our Lord. Let us kneel in prostration before our Maker. It's interesting, you quoted Psalms, and I'm giving you loads of Psalm passages. So in Psalm 95, 6, the way we pray is, is told to you up there. Before we offer our prayer, we do a little mini wash. We start with our hands and we finish by washing our feet in between washing other parts of the body. And that is also mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy where Moses would wash his hands and finish by washing his feet before he would offer congregational prayers. What we believe, Islam is the final religion sent by God to mankind as a completion of his, of, of his will. So, for example, if I was to ask you, what, was, what religion was Abraham? There was no Judaism when he was around. No, it was from Moses that actually came forth. So Abraham, we would say, was a Muslim. Because by, yeah, by a definition, by definition, he submitted his will to God. In those days, there was no augmented or finalized New Testament, Old Testament or Quran. But he was a, simply a submitter to the will of God. That, so by what that means is that that makes you a Muslim. So Islam was completed in its finality by God 1400 years ago. But its central message was right from the time of Adam, the first human, you know, to obey God. Are you following what I'm saying? So then what we say, because the Islamic religion is absolutely relentlessly thematic on the point that God is unlike his creation. Nothing can comprehend God. He's beyond the universe and he created everything and that is our creator and that is the creator to whom we should recognize and come towards and Islam gives you that very excellent proposition of that so the relationship would be praying five times a day in the way I've made mention then to do certain other goodly acts we've got to give 2.5 percent of our um, uh, gross savings to the poor and needy and then we've got to do other acts in addition to that but then doing acts which are pleasing to God by calling people to understanding who God is. Because one day we're going to all die and then we're going to be accountable. So what we believe is if, if, if that strong message is not given to you, then you will be tested in some other way when you appear before your Creator. But once the message is made crystal clear, then it becomes incumbent on you to accept and then, but at least before you accept, then to investigate. Because like I said, we've got the very best concept of God. I think it resonates with yourself as well. Unlike His creation, the moment you think of God, or give God um, Im imagery akin to mankind, then at that very juncture, you know, that, then God ceases to have that magnificence of Him. Yeah. Because of all the other religions, Hinduism, same thing, yeah. they make their major protagonists God, although they never claim to be God. This is what the third party narration say about them. Similarly, in the New Testament, Christ didn't claim to be God, but the, new, the other third party narratives, they elevate Him to a high extent but never calling him God. In those days, a person who was of a high disposition, he would be referred to as a God in the Greek um, verbiage. You could be, if you were like a, just say you're David Boys or whatever, you would be referred to as a God by the West Ham faithful as an example. It's just a, 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 um, you know, a, a, a usage of words to describe someone of a high inclination. Even the Satan is known as God in the Bible in 1 Corinthians. It simply, yeah, simply means, so 
then we've got to detect these terminologies, then we understand who the one true God is. Like Jesus says in, in, in the Gospel of Mark in 1228, here when the scribe asks him a question, what is the greatest of all commandments, O Rabbi? And he says to them, Hear thou, O Israel, your Lord God the Lord is one. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that's his main point. Yeah. yeah, and that's referencing Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, which says that the, that the, our, the Lord God, the Lord is one. No partner, no associates. Makes sense. That's the beauty of Islam, you see. It brings you back to who our Creator is, what our responsibility is to our Creator, because He's given us everything. He's worthy of praise. I know we use the word he, it's just a figure of speech. It's not a he, a she, a, 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 a man, a woman, an idol, a statue. You understand what I'm saying to you? No, yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, yeah. It's just the word terminology is used, which is similar used for God in the Bible as well. But it doesn't mean he's, he's like a man. Yeah, like yeah. Pronoun, yeah precisely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is what I'd invite you to. If that makes sense to you. No, yeah, like he's in. Yeah, like my brother asked me what, like, because he read the Bible first and said, like, oh, predict what the main kind of commandment was. And then I, I did predict that it was like that. And it's interesting that Islam is kind of distilling that idea. Fantastic. God, you see, what it came, it came to bring back the yeah. discrepancies and the errors which occurred in the Old and New Testament. Because the, by, the Quran says that the Old and New Testament was changed, it was corrupted. And we've got evidence of that as well. Tons of evidence. 1 John, 1 John 5, 7, in the letter of John, which says there are three that bear witness in the heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. They've taken that verse out of the Bible. And because it was a verse which Christians would commonly use to prove Trinity. But because it was a, a later edition in, in the much later manuscripts, then it was an interpolation put in. And that it was actually just done for the purpose of trying to instill this belief in Jesus being God, which, which is later taken. You can read it. 1 John, five, the letter of John, not the gospel. 1 John, chapter 5, verse 7. So what we're trying... Yeah, read it. It's the first letter of John. Yeah, because I've done a lot, a lot of research on, on John's gospel. So even in John's gospel, Jesus says, like in John 17, 3, it was John 14, 28, the Father is greater than I am. So many other verses within John's Gospel. But the thing about John's Gospel, it's written by a multiplicity of different authors. It went through several stages of edition and redaction. Yeah. So you had different people giving their own slant. According to Christian scholars, Christian Bible-believing scholars, they say that you know all these I am statements in John's Gospel. I am the way, the truth and the life. The oh, Father yeah. and I are one. He that has seen me has seen the Father. Before Abraham was I am. These, verse, these words, the historical Christ did not speak. Because in John's Gospel, it's very different from the earlier ones, Mark, Matthew and Luke. They are known as synoptic Gospels, seen through the eyes of. Whereas John's Gospel is commonly understood to being a very much allegoric, metaphorical, unhistorical Gospel. Which was... Is he one of the ones where he's like 50 years after? Right. What, 100 years after? Yeah, about 100 AD, so about 70, that's why scholarly consensus, John's Gospel, its earliest dating is between 95 and 100 AD, which oh, would wow. be, which would be, but there are other scholars who think it was much later. But anyway, the point, let's just go with that. So what John's Gospel is showing to you, is trying to elevate Christ more. Yeah. yeah. But, it, but it's never taking him to the, the, the level of being God, yeah. at any way, shape or form. Rather, it's just, whereas in, John, in Mark's Gospel, you can see he comes as a human, to the kingdom, uh, to, to speaks much about the kingdom of heaven in Mark, the first gospel. But in John's gospel, he speaks, seems to be speaking much more about himself. So historians have concluded if the earlier gospels of Mark, Matthew and Luke, they don't have these self-proclamatory statements, then these were editions which were added in by the author who thought Jesus ought to say this and has put those words onto Jesus' lips as if he said it. Gospel, that's it. So John's Gospel is considered a very much a different Gospel altogether. Uh, yes, literary license. Precise literary license, literary devices are used, which are not um, analogous to the earlier Gospels. So because it's so vastly different, vastly, um, uh, if you want to call it, uh, theological, in the sense that Christians use that to then determine their future um, uh, theologies. So for example, where in Mark's Gospel, for example, um, Simon, 
um, is uh, carrying the cross. To in John's gospel, we've got Jesus carrying the cross. Uh, yeah. So I, I was going to ask you, but out of curiosity, in those ones was that I am the way and stuff. Was it phrased differently originally, or was it more like you were saying like God is the way, or was it completely fabricated no, but, and he didn't say it at all? Yeah. Like, well, like I said, according to the major Christian cons consensus of, of scholarship, they say these words, which are uttered by Christ in John's Gospel, which I've just made mention, they were not his historical statements. They were words put into his mouth. But even if you say that they were, for the sake of argument, then all he's saying, this is a verse you quoted from John chapter 14, verse 6. We commonly speak to that, it's absolutely incredulous and bemusing why the Christians think that if he says, I am the way, the truth and the life, no man come through the Father except through me, that somehow makes him God. All he's showing to the Jews who, and to Thomas and to Philip, the people who ask him these questions, he's saying to them, follow my way. My way is the way to go. I'm, I'm, I'm an example set to you. So no, he's not, he's saying I am the way, but I'm not the destination. The destination is to get to God. So I am the way, the truth, meaning I speak to the truth. The message which I'm given, which God has given to me, as he has sent me, so I give you the truth. And then it's I am the life. What does the life mean? Following the life of Jesus Christ as an example, because they had transgressed, the Jews had essentially transgressed many, many times through the New Testament in different phases. They even killed their prophets, which we are familiar with. So what happened in this occasion? He said to them, follow my life. Your, the life you're leading is away from what you should be doing. So my life is an example to you. So as one who represents God, he's under the jurisdiction of saying these words. But perversely and bizarrely, somehow Christians read that and think, well, he must be God. Makes no sense whatsoever. As one who represents God, he has the authority to say, I am the way, meaning follow my way. I am the life, meaning follow life, my life's example. And I am the truth, meaning follow the truth, that which I speak to you. That's all he was saying. But somehow, no, this proves that he's God. That makes no sense in the grammar, in the etymology, within the construct of the context of John 14. No sense. So what's happened through history now is that now things are in the, in the age of communication and information people are beginning to realize, uh oh, there's been a lot of what you show mischief going on within the text. We need to come back to worshiping God and God alone. So often when Muslims, like for example, I will cite John 17, 3 as an example that even in John's gospel, God is the only true God and Jesus is the messenger. So Christians will say, well, isn't that double standards? You're making one reference to John's gospel to show that he is saying God is the only true God. And on the other hand, you're not accepting what we're understanding from John 14, 6. But what we say, as I said to you earlier, there are multiple different authors of the Gospel of John. And they're each espousing what they believe should, should be within the text. There are some who are writing genuinely in accordance with the previous scriptures. And there are those who are adding their own slant in. You understand? But even those, uh, my friend, who are adding their own slant in, they are not saying Jesus is God. So Christians commonly make re references like in John chapter 10 verse 30, a classic example where Jesus apparently says, the Father and I are one. Have you heard of that? Excellent. But if you read the context, it will determine to you why, in which context does he say the Father and I are one. He says it in the sense of one who is, has the same purpose of God, of bringing the Jews back to worshipping him. How on earth Christians conclude that this means he's God is nonsensical, absolutely nonsensical in, 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 in extremity, to be honest. So now people are beginning to realize and the threads of this, you know, disastrous belief in God being free in one is now being peeled away. And people are understanding, no, no, no. Jesus spoke of one God alone. He was a messenger of God. He spoke about doing God's will, not his will. Those questions that you had in your mind, I hope they've been clarified in terms of, yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? Perfect sense. I would invite you to accept Islam because what that does, my friend, it resonates with you. The fact you're even here on a warm summer's day, let me start, uh, yeah, I'm gonna put, I'll put myself in the sun and wait. So in, in effect, very briefly, it resonates with you. I mean, you had probably had a bit of training, you come back and you're probably tired, but the point is worshiping God and God alone. If that makes sense to you and you believe that, 
that makes you already a half Muslim. It sounds very strange, but it's the absolute truth. And the second part of it is that you believe that God sends messengers, of which you are familiar with already. And the final message is the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, who came for all of mankind with the same message as the previous prophets. He came to a transgressing Arab community who had gone haywire in their beliefs. And they, and they, were, bar, they were barbaric. So he brought them out of the darkness that they were in and put them into light by inviting them to worship God alone. Understand the same theme of the previous prophets. So that is something I want you to consider deeply. We're here regularly, 2.30 to 8 o'clock. I'll give, I'm going to quickly give you a copy of the Quran before you go. Yep. You want to come over perhaps and have a look? Thank you. Ashik. Makes sense, doesn't it? That's what we... So the, so the Old Testament does deliver that theme as well. But the Old Testament, then it, it goes a bit haywire in attributing certain things about God which are not akin to God. That like God coming down and wrestling with He's Jacob. Very present in the Old Testament. Yeah, very, yes, yeah. yeah. So we bring you back to that worshipping God alone. Let me just get your Quran. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Yes. 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 Me, last time I asked you about Allah. Okay.